Hi, this is Deborah Danielson. Welcome to the Rebel Podcast. We're going to be talking about some very important things today. Behind me, you'll see on my office wall is a picture of Manhattan when I used to work there and I used to build telecommunications um, facilities during a previous career and I loved it there. It was so amazing and so beautiful. So you'll see the Twin Towers right there and you'll see all of these people need housing. Today we're going to talk about affordable housing in the United States. I'm going to be joined by um, Wayland. He's a friend of mine. Um, millennials are challenged. A lot of people are challenged right now. So to find affordable housing in the United States is very difficult. And we're going to explore some of the latest statistics in an article that I thought was particularly interesting. And, it, you know, I saw it through Apple News, but uh, when Waylon gets on, we're going to talk about this, the five U.S. cities expected to have the highest rent prices in 2023. Now, I thought I had heard of everything, <laughs> but when I hear that a 95 square foot apartment in New York City is $1,000 a month. And then I saw photographs of it in this article, which was written by Mike Winters. And it's dated Sunday, December 18th, 2022. And it came out at 9 a.m. Eastern on CNBC. So if you want to find the article, that's where you can go get it. And it literally goes through the top five most expensive places to live that they're that they are anticipating for 2023 now you may say well deborah you know that doesn't bother me i live in omaha or i live in K paducah kentucky or i live i don't know maybe you people in florida might think that it's not as bad in Florida as it might be in New York, but guess what? One of the top five cities is Miami, which really surprised me because Miami has usually been a place where we've had a lot of immigrants, <clears throat> uh, Cubans, and a lot of other people coming into the country. And Florida has always offered a high quality of life and um, my daughter owned property down there in Hollywood, California for, or excuse me, Hollywood, Florida <laughs> for some time and even lived on the intercoastal down by Miami and Fort Lauderdale. So the rent back then was, I thought, in an acceptable range and it meant requirements of new immigrants, uh, people transferring, moving from state to state. In other words, there was still affordability for a first time homeowner, senior citizens, disabled people. And I would say it meant the threshold of a lot of low income people, not ultra low income, but low income people. And now what we're finding out is with inflation getting higher and higher in the United States, as a result of COVID and production shortages, people being without jobs, affordable housing is becoming more and more out of reach in our country. So there's more and more people that are homeless, they're living in shelters, pay a lot of, a lot of People can't move away from home. They're living with mom and dad. They're living in the basement. And hopefully you're not 40 years old and still living in your parents' basement. I know it makes you feel like, you know, you, you're not going to succeed. And then I, can, I know it can be very depressing, especially around the holidays. But 
I do believe I've come up with a solution and I would like to take my model that I have and I would like to project that out there and I'd like to have the opportunity to prove that model in. And this would be a model home that is brand new. They would be able to be run entirely off of your cell phone because they are smart homes. They are very energy efficient and they are safe. So a lot of the projects that we've seen or solutions what I is really what I should call them. A lot of the solutions that we've seen come out of um, federal housing or the like have been large scale projects that are not really appealing. They don't make you feel proud to live there or you don't really feel safe to live there. But I'm looking at a model where we target urban areas that have been largely left vacated because of unemployment, because of underemployment, just a whole host of economic issues that are facing cities. And the cities need to revitalize those areas. And they need people to go and move back into those areas. I'm looking at areas like that. You will see some of that footage if you listen to the podcast on Spotify. You can go in and see uh, the video or on YouTube is at Debra, D-E-B-R-A-D-A-N-I-E-L-S-E-N-5031, 5031. On YouTube for my podcast videos, for my music videos, and you can also check out my YouTube shorts. If you go to my YouTube shorts, you're going to see um, some information about this the search. I am entered into a contest to win a million dollars, and that's what our show's about today, is what do I think I could do if enough of you, my supporters, my fans, my friends would vote for me and I would actually win the search. Here is the advertisement for the search. Jake Paul, Paris Hilton, the Chainsmokers, Andrew East are the supporters. Vote for me now, please. By creator DAO. And... How could I take that million dollars and turn that into something very positive for not only our country, but for human beings? So it could be a win for me personally as a creator. It could be a win for anybody who potentially needs a new home, a first home, um, an affordable home. So that could be a first time home buyer. It could be a senior citizen. It could be someone who is disabled and it could also be low income. So what does that look like? A partnership between the public and the private sector. So we're gonna talk about that model. I hope after you listen to this podcast, you will be motivated to go place your vote for me for the search for creator DAO. That's who the decision makers are. There will be four people that will be funding this project. Paris Hilton is one of them. If you have not checked this out, I encourage you to go to Creator DAO on TikTok, on YouTube Shorts, and get the lowdown of all the information. But I have chosen to go in and take a look specifically at affordable housing. And you may say, first of all, well, Deborah, what do you have in the way of expertise? How would you even know how to do this? Uh, first and foremost, I've been in investing in real estate for the past 40 years. I love real estate. I also have a degree in land use economics. I've also put in four National Register Historic Districts, which comprise of roughly 1,700 
residential family units. So some of those could be rental properties. Some of those are single, mostly single family. But I have led many a neighborhood organization to put these residential historic districts in to save the beautiful homes, to add economic development and put money back into local preservation and ownership and pride of ownership in single family homes. And so we've seen just in my neighborhood, uh, we've seen a good uptick in home values. We have seen continued investment by new homeowners uh, who come into the market and first time homeowners uh, come into our neighborhood and be super excited about the history, how they can you know do historic gardening, how they can make their house um pretty much their historic castles. So it's good, but there's still pockets within each one of these residential historic districts that need economic revitalization. So those are the areas I'm going to talk about. And that would be where I would use, if I won the million dollars, I would use that as seed money to go in and acquire the properties spot properties that are vacant, that have partial housing left on them, just remnants because either the house has fallen in or the house has been sort of taken out, but not totally taken out. <laughs> um, some of these are properties where nobody maintains the property, et cetera. They're kind of like a slum and blight area. So I'm going to use my neighborhood. I'm going to use properties that are right around me that I know that I could affect change. And I want to use those as the model to take the money, the million dollars, if I should be so fortunate to get it as a creator and put up manufactured homes. And why manufactured homes? Because they're made in a factory they're done efficiently and effectively. And so if your communities like mine and a lot of the tradespeople have moved away to bigger cities where they could make more money and you no longer have the tradespeople you need or there's a shortage of tradespeople in your area, then you are free, free to get your house built in roughly 60 to 90 days, put it on the lot, bolt it down to a secure foundation with all the utilities, gas, water, lights, solar, already there waiting for you. And then to be able to turn that on and move into a house that's number one, fully furnished, if you want it fully furnished, or if you prefer to furnish it yourself, that's cool. But the plan is, is to make it so that it is budgeted, you know exactly what your payment is, there's no surprises, and it is affordable. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So please, please go in and vote for me, Deborah Danielson, and there will be a link to where you can go vote. Those votes are tallied on an on a real-time basis. So at any moment I can go in and I can see um who's been voting so hopefully i will see the numbers start climbing quickly there's a lot of competition for this and um there's a lot of important creators out there with over three four million followers so i appreciate every single one of you listening and watching and following me on spotify following me on youtube or any of my social media so heads up Voting ends January the 3rd, I think. So you will have to go in and take a look. I'm going to post a few photos of examples of this affordable housing. And I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at how beautiful these homes are and how you can have part of ownership and not have to feel like you're just, you know, living in like a military camp or... <laughs> or something that has no personality. And 
I just think this article kind of summarizes everything that's going on in the country right now and what we need to be aware of as far as what's going on in New York City, uh, Jersey City, New Jersey, Boston, Massachusetts, San Francisco, and Miami. Those are the, our target cities that we're going to be talking about today. This article basically states that New York City is expected to be the most expensive U.S. rental market in 2023. And it would take something seismic is the exact words from the author of this article, which is Mike Winters, for that to change according to the online realtor Zumper. So you can go in to Zumper's, the U-M-P-E-R, check out what is being written here. I don't need to tell, <laughs> I don't need to tell anybody um, who's living in New York how difficult it is to find beautiful housing, secure housing, affordable housing, and everything all in one space, okay? So New York, the median rent in December of 2022, right this month, is $3,738. In 2020, it was $2,399. That's a change of 56%. Well, with the pandemic hitting hard, a lot of people losing their jobs, a lot of people wanting uh, rent control to go away. 56% increase is a little hard to absorb. I don't know of anybody who got a 56% increase in income. Very few people did. And that's in very specific industries and situations. So... Prior to the pandemic, it says median rent for a one bedroom home in New York City was closer to $3,000, which for New York City, I know it sounds like an atrocious amount of money, but really that wasn't too horrible. There's a, the problem is there's just a lack of affordable housing there. That's it. There's just not enough being built and there's more and more people coming there because there's jobs there there's opportunities there so who want to work in new york are having to move to new jersey which is you know not that far away so it's a commute but it's doable so the median rent there is three thousand one hundred and two dollars a month right now December of 2020, it was 1825 which is way more affordable than New York City, which was 2399 But still, for Jersey City, that's 70% increase since the pandemic. And believe me, unless you're working two jobs or a second job or you got a huge promotion, that kind of jump in a monthly expense, and we're not talking about anything but rent. We're not talking about the groceries, the gas, you know, any of that. We're just talking about rent. Going up 70% is just a little bit hard to absorb. Now, Boston. Boston, comparatively, has only seen a percentile change of 40%. Now, I know that sounds ridiculous because that's still high, but their median rent right now in December in Boston is $3,009, significantly cheaper than that of New York City, which is at $3,738. Now, when they started measuring all of this in 2020 in Boston, the median rent in December of 2020 was $2,143. So it's a 40% increase. The problem they have there is because of prohibitive zoning laws that favor single family homes. 
one of the things that makes my proposition so much more acceptable right now is that and doable and possible is that we have um, changed the zoning laws where I live. So we don't have inclusionary zoning, but what they did was the city went back and recently redefined what constitutes a single family home. And they opened that up to manufactured homes. So manufactured homes are, I think, the key here, along with the rezoning and along with a new zoning called inclusionary zoning to start stamping out the problem of unaffordable housing, unaffordable rent, unaffordable property, right? So additionally, you know, when you have laws that are especially challenging in Boston because they want single family homes, the new inventory that's coming online is toward the luxury market. Why? Because there's more profitability there, right? You've got people who've got surplus income, they're ready and willing to spend it. So because of the pandemic, a lot of materials are just not available. They haven't been producing as much steel. This price of steel has gone up four or five hundred percent. There's been it's been hard to get plywood. It's been hard to get OSB. It's been hard to get a lot of building materials. Just here in Omaha and Council Bluffs, it was hard to get concrete. You couldn't get a driveway put in or a sidewalk put in, a foundation poured. You had to get on a waiting list. And then that drove an employment for the concrete carriers. Um, it's just been like one thing after the other. In San Francisco, it's been a little bit more stable. So the rent in San Francisco for 2022 in December is 2,975. Now, I never thought I would be so amazed at San Francisco being more affordable, but significantly a better rental deal there per month than in New York. The median rent in December of 2020 was 2,668. So they've only had a 12% change there. Now that's a doable thing. It doesn't make it easy to swallow, but it's a lot more hospitable to people. So while New York has been one of the most expensive rental markets in the US in 2022, San Francisco had held the previous title for the prior six years of being one of Zumper's most expensive places to live at nearly $3,000 for a one bedroom. Now, Miami, we're looking at Miami. Miami, my goodness, the affordable place that I always loved. Gosh, in December of 2022, Miami was at $2,705. The median rent in December for 2020 was 1,647. That's a 64% change in Miami. I just found that incredible. So there's been such a huge influx of new residents in the last two years. It's been, as of February of 2021, Miami ranked as the 14th most expensive rental market. By March of 2022, it became the fourth most expensive market in the country, and it's held on to the number four spot ever since then. I guess the most incredible part of the story that I read was about a 23-year-old person who's living in New York, his mom had to co-sign the rent lease. He's living in a 95 square foot apartment. It's $1,000 a month. He had to put down a $2,000 rental deposit. He has a shared shower 
and a shared toilet. He lives in a five-story apartment building in New York. And he's just thankful for the one window that he has. <laughs> he sleeps on a twin mattress. And literally, he has one of those little tiny bathroom sinks as his sink. He cooks his meals on a hot plate. And he brings his bicycle up four flights of stairs every night because one of his part-time jobs is, is that he's a bicycle messenger, delivery person. And another thing is, is that he does deliveries with that bicycle. So it's very important to his income. He's also a content creator. And, you know, he's really excited to be able to go out and to do this and to, you know, live in New York and he lives on the East side. So he's happy to do that. He's happy to pay his bills. But honestly, at 23 years old, living basically in something the shape of a hallway of 95 square feet and shelling out that kind of money, that's really sort of sad. I would like to see um, this kind of situation where we could go into some areas that are available within cities, urban areas that are on bus lines, that are in walking distance to an entertainment district, bars, restaurants, et cetera, to where people could have some of this spot manufactured housing and through a public and private partnership be able to live in a brand new energy efficient furnished home and be able to afford to live and not have to pay 80 to 90 percent of what you make on your job to pay for your house to pay for your rent but to get that down to more of a 30 to 40 percent range so that you could afford some clothing, you could afford some transportation, et cetera. Even if you work from home, that's still a big amount of money to put out. So if you believe affordable housing is a challenge, I wanna hear from you and I want to uh, hear your opinion on my idea. Doing the program and I told everybody that you're gonna pop in and join us. Oh, okay. I, I didn't know how, if you were still going to be able to join us. So I'm really glad that you are. are we Love live in or, or is it? Back there. It's so pretty. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I figured, I was like, what would be a better background than the Christmas tree? Oh, I love it. And you know what else I love? You put tinsel on it. Oh, yeah. Tons of tinsel. Yeah. A lot of people don't do that anymore. I just <laughs> love it. It just adds, you know, some nostalgia. Yeah, my dogs love it too. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all over TikTok, it. there's videos of dogs and cats eating the trees, the ornaments. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. hell. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, I went over just FYI. I went over the article um, about the five U.S. cities expected to have the highest rent prices in 2023. So I've kind of set the stage for everybody here about New York and Boston and San Francisco and Miami and Jersey City. But I thought, you know, because there's going to be a lot of listeners today that are going to say, oh, well, you know, we don't live on the coast and we're not in Los Angeles. And I was really surprised that Los Angeles didn't make the list, but yeah, that is surprising. I know it's crazy. Um, but you know, all over the country, prices are rising because of well, the pandemic drove that. But now we just have a lot of demand and inflation and shortages of raw materials. So I thought you would be an excellent guest today because. First time home buyers 
struggle, right? Mm -hmm. They struggle to get down payments. They struggle to find a house. Well, let's, let's be honest, especially when you don't buy a brand new house, but you get a house that's cheap. And I'm going to go cheap like this because <laughs> the price may be low -er than what you would be paying for another house. But the things that are unseen, the things that have to be fixed, you know, like maybe the water heater is bad or maybe the wiring is bad. So it burns up the house. I mean, <laughs> there's all kinds of stuff, right? Yeah. I mean, there's all sorts of unseen and um, unexpected expenses that you don't think of. I mean, we, so when we found our house before that, I think we put in offers on probably five houses, um, not including one that we looked at where um, the owner was going to make us this deal. But um, when we got down to the basement, the foundation was literally like just caving in and it was oh, um, no. basically being held up by the center of the, the center wall of the base. <laughs> Everything else was like, it was becoming an A-frame house basically. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you know, so, a foundation is like one of the most expensive things to repair because you got to jack the house up, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's it basically unlivable until you fix right. it because it's dangerous, you know. And that's, <clears throat> I mean, that's another thing too. I, I know you probably saw recently in Omaha, there was a whole um, apartment complex that was where people were evacuated because it was unlivable. It was, it didn't meet code. So even finding just, if you find affordable housing, you're taking the chance that it may be dangerous, you it's know, bad. at this and point. That and the landlords are oftentimes, well, in the city of Council Bluffs, I can speak to this, they are sort of self-checking. So they'll go in and you'll get a piece of paper in the mail. I know because I'm officially a landlord, but you'll get a form. And then every so many years, they'll actually come and inspect the property. Okay, and they'll be very picky, but they're still kind of lenient around here. But can you imagine putting the fox in charge of the hen house, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he's got the form. He's going <clears throat> down it. Yeah, all my stair railings are secure. Yeah, all my outlets are secure. Well, hell, a lot of these guys haven't done any maintenance on these houses with certified electric electricians you know, or companies who are good at home inspections or anything. And a lot, as you know, in our area here, a lot of them just try to skate by because they're afraid to raise the rents or they just don't want to do anything. Let's be honest. Well, because they know they can, you know, yeah. too. Yeah. So <laughs> if you can get away with it and still make money, why not? Why I guess. not? Right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> So what, what happened with these, because you're out there and you're bidding against other people, the prices of the houses just keep going up and up. Mm -hmm. And so then you, you're, you're in a situation where you finally get a house. So what happened when you finally got the house you got? Um, well, we got it by luck just because um, it was a really weird story, but basically my grandfather had been best friends with the people that owned the house or that had built the house um he was friends with their uncle wow. their great uncle um like during the depression it was a very it was like kiss me i mean it you know it i could not have dreamed up a better outcome <laughs> but because this was like our dream house too or yeah or it was our it checked all the boxes so cool yeah but that doesn't happen for everyone you know no, but still, so. how, long did, how long did it take you guys once you started looking how long did it take you to finally get a house where you could sign on the dotted line and know that you were going to get the house um i think we looked for over a year and this was five years ago too so the market wasn't as bad right then as it is now right um this so right now yeah. So being a first time home buyer and 
looking for, you know, a, a home that's not your forever home necessarily, but, um, you know, someplace that you want to live and um, that you can be proud of is, kind of, it's a hard thing to do. It's a balancing act. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So once you got your house, which by the way, if anybody here wants to see what Waylon and Travis's house look like, go back on my YouTube channel, go to the house tour we did on the mid-century modern and yeah. then you can just all go, oh my God, I love it. But go <laughs> back and check it out because that was earlier this year in 2022. So yeah, that was so tell me fun. now, once you got the house, what kind of unexpected expenses started happening? Um, oh my gosh. Like, uh, so electrical stuff, plumbing stuff. Um, plus when you, when you, you know, move into a house, you know, you want to redo, um, certain things just for aesthetic reasons or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. our, you know, our thing was we wanted an older house, but we wanted a, you know, a 1950s house because we love 1950s style. Right. And so, um, the thing that was probably the most unexpected was just like plumbing things that just wore out you know yeah um things with like our washer and dryer the the drainage and yeah. um connecting pipes are <laughs> one of our toilets just like basically the bolt broke or something that was holding it to the floor so you know just like dumb things like that but then that leads into other expenses that you don't even realize like you have to do this other thing in order to get you know the other thing fixed and then yeah it's just it's <laughs> never ending time, and by the time you're done during that first year what would you say that your out of pocket was that you didn't even think you were ever going to have oh my gosh well, i don't know was it five thousand or less was it ten thousand or less what do you think it was um, the first year we mainly just painted and stuff like that. The second and third year was probably, yeah, 5,000 or more. Yeah. Yeah. It was, <laughs> it, well, and some things like I'm not very good at like electrical things or like plumbing things. I don't really want to even attempt it. You know, <laughs> I don't yeah, want to burn down Life the house is on the line, it. man, when you're, when you have a fire, like, and here's the thing with the older houses, even if they were maintained really well, what your house was, I mean, mm -hmm. you did not have a house that was in bad condition. No, not at all. Yeah, our, the person that owned our house took um, like immaculate care of it, you know. Exactly. But here's the thing. Just because we have new appliances, we have new devices that when your house was built, Nobody ever thought about that. Right. And, and so you got to have a bigger electrical panel to be able to power up all of these new gizmos, right? Right. The coffee machines, right? We don't have Mr. Coffee anymore, you know, with the burnt coffee on one little burner all day. So, <laughs> but we have big coffee machines now. We have big toasters. We have you know, all kinds of dishwashers and stuff that back back in the day when your house was built or my house was built, well, hell, they didn't even know how to spell dishwasher when my house was built. It was built <laughs> in 1878. Yeah, and dishwasher it, was spelled W-O-M-A-N back then. <laughs> with chapped hands. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you want to get this? Do you know what my plumbing was in my kitchen? I still have it. I swear to God, it was a mounted pump and you would have to pump the water. Yeah. yeah. I had indoor plumbing, but it was a hand pump. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing though. Yeah. I still have it. I'm so excited about that. But Modern convenience. So I know it was at that time. <laughs> so it's really weird how we redefine you know, our technology, which then redefines our houses, which then redefines all of our expenses. So even though your house was in good shape and even though it was well-maintained, there's just been expenses that come 
with home ownership. And mm -hmm. so part of the problem of affordability is, is trying to get a lock and load on those kind of transient expenses. Well, and just things that you never think about, you know, um, and a lot of people, when they see an older house, which I'm totally guilty of too, you see like all the charm and all of the, you know, you think of all the things that may have happened there or like all of the, like, I don't know, you just see the beauty of an, of an older house. But then once you move into an older house, <laughs> you see all the uh, things that, you know, just um, could go wrong. That, right. Or things that were, you know, may have been up to code when it was built or um, may not have been even. <laughs> but, right. Uh, right. People, but the, people like to do a lot of their own stuff to save money, right? Yeah, exactly. And you, you find all of that stuff and it's, um, you know, it, it just becomes something that you really have to do, especially if it's electrical or plumbing or even, you know, like I said before, like that house with the foundation so there are things that you just can't ignore and you have to pay for them. <laughs> so oh, yeah. 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 And the buck stops right then and there, doesn't it? Right. Yeah. Especially so. like if your floor drains plugged and your washer's draining and there's like, oh my God going on on the floor. You yeah. don't have time to debate that. It's like we gotta get this fixed right now. Right. We actually had something like that happen. And then that starts to affect other things like your walls because there's water getting into the walls or something you know or the flooring it gets under the flooring or you know it's just one thing goes wrong and it can lead to several other things so especially if you let things like that go you can get mold and milk yeah. problems which cause horrible health problems right yeah so and that's another expense is your health <laughs> oh yeah and you don't want to screw with that because that no. <laughs> that's no fun and because you did get a beautiful period house, tell us a little bit about how the furniture shopping goes. Well, so we, when we bought this house, we had the dream that we were going to buy a, you know, 50s ranch and we were going to make it as, um, as period as possible as, you know, sticking with the whole theme. We love a theme, so. <laughs> Yeah, as authentic as possible. So um, we found a lot of, I love Haywood Wakefield furniture. My husband does too. Um, so we just kind of tried to buy it as, um, find as many like inexpensive uh, pieces as we could. Yeah. So, um, which has been really fun, but it's also been, I've gone all over i've gone to texas i've gone to like oklahoma to find things <laughs> so, wisconsin um so that's been fun but a lot of adventures the problem and, and i mean that is cool and that's how i'm wired up too it's i guess part of the fun of having these old homes is the adventures we go on the stories mm -hmm. we hear, the nostalgia we get to collect, right? Right. The problem is, is especially when the market's hot for mid-century modern furniture. Right, yeah. And you see something like, I have a vase from my grandmother. And, you know, my grandma was not rich. She was a nurse. And she helped people. She always wanted to help people. So, you know, she had this vase. It's bright orange. Probably, you know, it went in and out of style now at least five times since she bought it. <laughs> <laughs> and when she bought it, she probably paid maybe five, ten dollars for it. Okay. But if I would put that thing out there for sale, right? And I've kept it because I don't know. It just reminds me of the Brady Bunch. Okay. I just love it. <laughs> but if yeah. I put that thing out there for sale, it could go five to $700. Oh yeah. Easily. Yeah. It's um, it. So I've always loved fifties stuff and yeah. like art deco and mid-century stuff. And I used to buy it at like, so, you know, 20 years ago, I could pick up things at garage sales for, 
a quarter or a dollar that people <laughs> pay hundreds of dollars now for. Um, yeah. It just blows my mind still when I um, see some of the prices on stuff. Um, I think it's kind of starting to cool a little bit now, but um, we'll see. Because it's still um, like the things that we have, like the Haywood Wakefield furniture, it's solid wood. Mm -hmm. It's actual like quality, you know, really well made stuff. Mm -hmm. So that kind of stuff is kind of always has some value, I think, or to me, it does anyway. Well, of course. And, you know, yeah. it's like it's like any art piece, right? Because when I come to your house and I look at your furniture, I, first of all, am transported to a whole time zone. I mean, I'm in a whole different era and I love it. I feel like I'm part of the Jetsons, you know, I feel <laughs> like food could pop out of the wall and a robot could roll up there, but I yeah. just love it. And I just, I love the curtains that you have found and the lampshades. I mean, right down to every last detail. It Thank is you. perfect. Um, you could be on the marvelous Mrs. Maisel program. <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I watch some like shows like that and I'll see I'm like, oh, we have that. We have that lamp or we have that. I know. You know? <laughs> We were watching um, The Bishop's Wife the other night because David likes to watch TCM. Oh, yeah. And it's got Jimmy Stewart in there, and David Niven, and it's in black and white. Mm -hmm. And it takes place in this mansion that's incredible. And all of a sudden, they're like look, panning around the entryway and the staircase. And I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. David, did you just see that? And he's like, what? You know? He didn't know what the hell was going on. I go, did you see that Newell Post lamp? That's our Newell Post lamp there. Oh, no way. That's amazing. Oh, my God. And he goes, <laughs> so he immediately gets on his phone. And he goes, this movie was filmed in Minneapolis. Well, David grew up in St. Louis Park, which is a suburb of Minneapolis. And I go, oh, my God. The people I bought this lamp from, this new post light, still has the tassel on it. You know, it's a man with a big hat on, hand on the hip, and it's got this hand holding up the gas light. And then there's this tassel, very distinctive shape, right? So the person I bought this from used to live in Minneapolis. Yeah. How crazy is that? I wonder if it's the same. That's what I told him. I said, oh my God. They probably tore down the house. We got the damn new post lamp. <laughs> yeah, well, because how many of those could there actually be? You know. Oh, there, there can't be. No, there can't be many of those. That's amazing. And that was la that was last Friday or Thursday. I can't remember, but it was TCM. I mean, it's just like crazy stuff. See, that's an example of like the the cool things you find having an old house. <laughs> that's an example. <laughs> But there are yeah. other examples that are not a bit cool. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> like when you have water spewing out or you have, uh, like when I moved in here, I couldn't even, listen, I couldn't even plug in a crock pot and a toaster and a coffee machine. It blew everything out. Oh in my God. My yeah. So, I mean, we had to go through our our just our wiring our electrical revamp was damn near a hundred thousand dollars wow yeah because believe me in 1878 there was no there was my house used to have all gas pipes they're still in it and so i have gas pipes going to all the chandeliers and so we had to make sure that each chandelier had electric in it. So we had to take everything down. We had to refurbish where the lights were missing because they just couldn't afford to do anything. And there was just duct tape up there or plastic chandeliers from the fifties that look like sprockets. <laughs> 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 or my favorite was the plastic AM am radio that was in the bathroom it was a toilet paper it doubled as a toilet paper holder and it was pink do you want to know something i have a blue one just like that <laughs> i haven't put it up yet because travis won't let me but 
I'm like, wow, this had to be invented by a guy because really, I mean, it doesn't yeah. matter how much time a woman spends in the bathroom, but I swear to God, the bathroom is David's like second home. It's like his office. He goes in there, <laughs> got his magazines, he takes a snack, you know. Oh my God. <laughs> it was a time. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, I guess, I guess it's a privacy thing. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway. But we so what other, what other thing would you say you would tell like a millennial, a first time home buyer that they should really pay attention to as far as deciding whether something fits in their budget or not, if they should even bid on a house? Um, I mean, there are so many things, but you have to think of um, the, well, it sounds so cliche, but think of the future. So you may find a house that's great. It may not be in such a great neighborhood, but if you do some research, you may find, um, you know, this neighborhood may, the city council may have plans for this neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know, where you may have the opportunity to buy a house that's going to go up in value because the neighborhood is going to get better because of efforts by the city or something like that. Yeah. Um, there you have to think of how much money you may have to invest um you know think of does it have new heating and air does it have new plumbing does it have new electrical all those not so sexy not so fun right. things about a house but once you move in somewhere once you buy that house they become the most important things that you just like that's all you can think about because <laughs> those are so yeah. they're so costly they keep um, you awake at night, you know? Yeah, I mean, and you also have to think about your neighbors, um, too. The, um, that can be, uh, as you know. That's a big deal. That's a really yeah. big deal. So just so I'm going to give you one example. The very first week we moved in here, it was December the 6th, all right? That means it was winter time. We're in the Midwest, upper Midwest. It was cold. There was snow on the ground. And around one or two o'clock in the morning, I heard a woman screaming. I jump up. I look out the window, running down the middle of the street, butt naked, not a stitch of anything on was a woman. Hi. Oh, wow. And I'm like, Oh my God, I moved from the suburbs to the inner city because I loved this house and I couldn't think of anything 10 foot tall doors, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and now look at this. I mean, I don't know whatever happened to that woman, but honest to God, that was not a good situation. Can you imagine no. frostbite? I mean, it was like probably only like 10 degrees outside. Wow. I hope she got so, neighborhood. And neighbors are extremely important. Yeah, especially, um, you know, if you're moving into, like for us, you know, as a gay couple, a gay married couple, that can be very um, scary. If you are moving to a neighborhood where you, where you may not um, be so accepted. So that's something to really think about. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's things have gotten a lot better in the last... I don't know, 20, 30 years. Um, right. But there are still people out there that aren't so <laughs> accepting or friendly towards right. things like that. Well, our hood's always open. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. And so I, think, I think that's part of what has really launched our neighborhood is that it's been very warm and welcoming to LGBTQ plus right mm -hmm. and i i just have been so proud of how our neighborhood has really turned a corner and so i was just telling everybody before you joined um about the contest the search yeah i think this is season one or season two i can't remember but uh it's a contest pound sign that or hashtag the search 
and hashtag creator DAO. But I am I am lobbying for everybody to vote to support me. I'm trying to go for the million dollar prize. It's based upon votes. And if I would win, if I would be so fortunate to be selected by everybody, I would use that million dollars as seed money to come in and revitalize vacant lots that are a slum and blight on the neighborhood. And I, I eat my own dog food, drink my own Kool-Aid, right? And I've got the lots all picked out. I have one historic house picked out. But what I love about manufactured homes and a partnership between the public, that's the government, and the private, which would be me as, a, <clears throat> as an investor, and then our little group, would be that they affect the zoning. So our zoning just recently changed to include manufactured housing. There's a lot of new zoning across the country called inclusionary zoning, so that it's not so geared toward just <clears throat> single family homes that only wealthy people or a certain caliber of wealth could afford. Mm -hmm. And what I find is, is that the inner city neighborhoods with these vacant lots or blighted properties that could be easily removed, those neighborhoods could also offer huge potential for first time home buyers, for people of low income, people who are senior citizens who need to save money or downsize and disabled people. Many of these lots are very close to or within walking distance of uh, restaurants, bars, and other services, you know, mm -hmm. social services. I, I have social services two blocks from me, for example. Libraries, stuff like that, yeah. Library is a few hundred feet from my front door. Yeah. Fire department is on the opposite corner down here. I mean, mm -hmm. It's just easier to maneuver. You don't really need to have a car. So there's another expense that you could kind of get rid of. Or if you work from home, I mean, you could even drive a moped if you wanted to. I mean, yeah. you know. <laughs> so I just want to encourage, um, and I thought it'd be great to have you on because you can speak uh, from a millennial perspective what everybody faces, right? And you can vouch for the fact that in the last five years, You've seen great equity in growing your home. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. The equity in our house has grown. I think we're, our house is worth nearly twice what we paid for it now. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's a huge thing that you'd... Actually, I never really even thought about it when we moved to our house. When we bought our house, I was like, you know, it's it may go up in value a little bit, but, you know, who knows? But... Um, but you yeah, bought smart. You bought smart. And you well, thought that's, about it. Yeah. And that's why I mentioned, you know, thinking about the neighborhood too, because our neighborhood, um, the city has invested money in the neighborhood, new schools, um, new, even things as silly as like, you know, the curb. Oh, they invested yeah. Money in, in the curb, which makes, um, it's a big you know, deal. This, <laughs> it's a big deal that you don't really even think about. Yeah. <laughs> But that will increase your the value of your neighborhood, um, and and there therefore increase the value of your house too. So exactly, and where I want to put up some of these modular manufactured homes, that by the way they could be even in Malibu, they're that attractive and beautiful. Yeah, they're right across the street from a brand new library that the city put up that's incredible prairie schoolhouse frank lloyd wright looking architect yeah. it's right on a major bus line i mean it's easy to get to and from the airport i mean you are literally within 10 miles of the airport so i mean and then the hospitals are within six blocks to a mile yeah very close I mean, everything that you would need is there. Public park is a block away. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Well, and you're the perfect person to do this too, because you have so much experience in 
you know, improving neighborhoods, um, you know, all of that stuff. And you're able to, I mean, these structures are modern and they have, a, most of them have a really modern appearance, but they are beautiful and they would look beautiful in that neighborhood. Even, even you know, juxtaposed against the, the historic buildings around them, they I still- It would complement each fit. other. Yeah. <clears throat> they're not trying to be anything that they're not, but they they are beautiful on their own, you know. Exactly, and people could be proud of that mm -hmm. and proud to live there. And I also think people would one of the model. Well, most of the homes have big windows up front, but one of them has a big wraparound porch along with the windows. So, like, if you like to sit out on your front porch and meet people and greet people or just watch people i mean that's fascinating yeah. it is yeah. lovely, anyway we get <laughs> going on down here we yeah have, i've seen some <laughs> we i mean we have parades we have all kinds of things going on over here <laughs> yeah that's true. and i haven't seen any naked people run down the neighborhood streets lately that's a good thing yeah <laughs> see the neighborhood improved it got better. It really did. Yeah. But I did have some logs roll down the hill the other day and end up on my parking. <laughs> I don't know where those came from. But... That's free firewood. Right there. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so you've seen these houses. I've shown you a couple of the models. And the one house is ultra modern. It was designed in the European style where everything is built in. The furniture is built in. The cooktops are induction. That means you could never, ever get burnt. Yeah, I love that. You put your hand on it and you're still not going to get burnt. So if you're a mom with little kids, you don't have to worry. Um, and the other cool thing is you can run these houses with your phone. Yeah. But I also think that you and Travis would be an excellent part of this because if people, you know, we got some folks that bought some of these houses of first time home buyers or senior citizens, or they just love the vintage vibe of the fifties, right? Uh -huh. Better to decorate it than you guys. I mean, <laughs> you are so good at finding things on a budget putting things together that just look spectacular, but you don't break the bank over it, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, the mother, of, what is it? The mother of invention is necessity. So that's, yeah. kinda, <laughs> that's how that happened. Basically. And we you know, know about that. <laughs> yeah. When you want something so badly, but you, you know, don't want to spend the money or you don't have the money to spend, you find ways of making it work. And yeah, but, I've learned so much doing that, you know, how to find things that are, you know, incredible, but not spending any money on it just because somebody else can't see, you know, what it is or, you know. And so. that, that old saying, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Yeah. Every day that's true, right? Oh yeah, for sure. And yeah, there are so many people that throw out things or just, um, you know, will list things online for, a few dollars that and they have no idea <laughs> it's worth you know money or or that it's you know how useful it is you know even if it's not worth a ton of money or anything it's still useful to someone and could if be beautiful you love it, if you love yeah. it really and truly that's all that matters right exactly I will I will leave everybody with one last thought and I'm going to give a plug to all the antique malls and little junk stores, whatever you want to call them. But I just love how I can go in and buy handmade lace that's exquisite for less than two to three dollars. Yeah. Yeah. And so I've been buying up lace like crazy. But then if you go to buy something in a department store, Neiman Marcus, Horchow's, any of these places, that same stuff is well over a hundred dollars. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I always think of the time that must have went in to that. And how many of those pieces were made by 
lamplight or candlelight. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> and some lamp. and someone's selling it for a couple of dollars. It's like yeah, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I've got some. I've got some of these hanging up in my kitchen on the wall that are only I'm going to say four by four inches, but they're from the mid 1800s. And some are like little animals that were made. And I just think they're the coolest things ever. You know, it's just charm. You're not going to go get if you go down to Hobby Lobby and start loading up your cart. And yeah. I never spent that much for these, you know. Yeah, and you can find those every day at, at, at an antique mall or, um, you know, vintage stores. Yeah. They have tons of that stuff because people... A lot of the time, someone will put that in their cedar chest. You know, it was grandma's or great grandma's. We're not going to use it, but we're going to keep it because we know she spent so much time on it or whatever, you know, <laughs> and it stays in perfect condition because nobody right. uses it. And then it eventually, you know, somebody dies or goes into a nursing home or something. And those things just go scattered to the wind and end up in an antique store for yeah. And then <laughs> the great grandkids and the grandkids go, who would want this? Yeah. What is this crap? <laughs> we were watching Antiques Roadshow last night and I couldn't believe this. And so these people brought a painting in and it was the blue boy. And you know, that's just a reproduction. It's not the yeah. real blue boy, right? I've seen right. the real blue boy. It's gigantic. But this was a small blue boy. And so the husband went over. He liked the frame. The frame just caught his eye. And so he went to a garage sale and he goes, hey, how much How much for this? And the guy goes, well, you know, I'm thinking about just pitching this because like, you know, the frame's sort of gaudy and it's really not that cool. But he goes, yeah, okay, well, if I, how about $40? So the guy goes, I don't know. I got to think about it. So he walks away. He's talking about it with his wife and they're just kind of walking around. So about 20 minutes later, he's got this insatiable innate urge. He's got to have this damn frame. So he goes back. He gives the guy 40 bucks. Now we're on Antiques Roadshow. <clears throat> so he took the frame apart to clean this thing. And just like a lot of these things, somebody put a picture over a picture. Oh, okay. So the little reproduction blue boy guy, which was worthless, right? It was cute, but it was worthless. Behind right. that was an original hand-signed, very rare piece of artwork, pastoral. That was worth oh. over $25,000. Oh my God. <laughs> I know <laughs> <laughs> so you never know what <clears throat> what you may be looking at at a garage sale at an antique store but it's no different than the day I went in and I showed this to you guys up by my front foyer front door. yeah uh, I paid like 25 or 40 dollars for this this picture that because it had this little miniature design in the very outskirt of the photo or the picture, it was like a wagon train led by all these big longhorn steers. I just had to have it. Turns out that that's worth quite a bit of money too, because it was done in the late 1800s, right before this guy died. And there's a museum in New York where this guy used to live. And this is one of the things that they didn't know was still available. But down in Oklahoma City, when I took it to the Western Cowboy Museum, they just lost their minds. And they go, yeah, this the, this belongs up in his museum up in New York. I'm like, yeah, well, I'm wow. just going to go home and hang on my wall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I love that picture, too. It's a, it's an etching, isn't it? Or is, it's, a... it's a pencil drawing is what I finally... I couldn't really make out if it was ink, like a pen and ink or what it was, but they finally said that it was a pencil drawing. Wow. I've had a couple things happen like that. Not, well, I had, so 
20 years ago or so, I went to uh, Miami for a concert, a Madonna concert. Of course. <laughs> of course. Why not? And, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and a friend and I were at, uh, we were in downtown Miami and there was an artist that was painting these um, paintings. He had a little stand um, and he had some of his work hanging up and they were all of this um, very <laughs> voluptuous lady who was nude in a lot of the paintings or she would be just having like a bath towel, but she had these big eyes uh -huh. and she looked exactly like my roommate at the time and my best friend. So wow. I was like, I have to have one of these. She'll think it's amazing. So I buy one. My friend who I went to Florida with thought I was crazy for buying it, but so I think I paid like maybe $20 for it. Yeah. So I get it home. My roommate hated it. She thought that's, <laughs> she thought it was an insult. <laughs> but oh it looked my fun. God. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I kept it because I loved it anyway. Um, and then 20 years later, I find out um, it's, it was this artist named Botero who is really famous now. And that's what he paints are these kind of Zoftig women. So <laughs> Way to so, go. Yeah. I know. Way to go. <laughs> yeah. And art, yeah. art, just like a house or just like architecture, you know, it's an individual thing. And when you have the eye for great lines or great structure, that's timeless. And then you have the most opportunity to increase the value. So I think you've done very well. You guys have done amazing. And I love your Christmas yeah. tree behind you. I see there's bubble Thanks. light. I see bubble yeah. light on there too. Please go now and place your vote for Deborah Dash Danielson, the search.